All right, church, tonight you are going to be a blessed. As I told you a little while ago, all the way from Lima, Peru, we have a very special guest in the house. He was with us a few months ago uh, toward the end of last year. And let me tell you, it was an incredible, incredible Sunday. We were so blessed. And I, I just, I was in awe. I believe uh, you're going to hear one of the greatest teachers, preachers uh, in the world. I'm telling you, Sunday he preached two different messages and uh, both of them were so inspiring and I believe full of richness. And I believe that today, if you lean in and uh, take some notes and open up your heart, God is going to bless you. Uh, him and his wife and his family are doing just such a phenomenal uh, job of leading an incredible community and church in Lima, Peru. I believe they have about a thousand campuses already uh, all over uh, Peru. Uh, a church of almost 15, almost 20,000 people. I mean, huge church. And he, he'll tell you a little bit more about it. But also, I believe a greater work than that is he is going around the globe and just truly leading a revolution of churches uh, to reach people, to reach the lost. I mean, just God is using him in a phenomenal, phenomenal way. I believe you're going to be blessed tonight by hearing him. Can we get up on our feet and can we give a Calvary Kendall welcome, loud welcome to Pastor Robert Barringer. Come on, let's welcome him. Amen. Good evening. Please be seated. Just before we get started, Tonight, with this little teaching, I just have to confess something. And um, this is a true confession. It's my fault it rained today. <laughs> I take all the credit for that. You see, in Lima, in Lima, we haven't had measurable rain in over 100 years. So I was probably the only one in about 1,000 miles enjoying myself today. <laughs> It was fun. I, we just never get to see that. So just want you to know I take credit for it. But thank God that my faith kind of started weaning it toward the end and it broke up so you can come to church. So just had to say that. Um, greetings from Peru. Uh, any Peruvians here? There's a few. Yes. God loves Peru. I know that because the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. And until you've eaten Peruvian food, I mean, once you eat Peruvian food, every good and perfect gift comes from God. I mean, he is there. The problem is, is God created the first plate. It's the devil that tells me to eat the second and third plate. So, um, which is an issue. Uh, just came back. I was in Spain, and that's why I'm kind of bouncing, skipping through Miami. Uh, I just came back from ministering to a whole bunch of churches there through Spain. Any Spanish people here from Spain? No? <laughs> Amen. Um, que Dios les bendiga. Me siento mejor hablando en español. ¿Cuántos de aquí hablan español? Yeah, prefiero hablar en español. Um, quiero present a couple from our church who is now from this church and I say that you know with the love and pain that they've left our church but now they're a part of this church but Diego and Patty they ran our orphanage for helped us in the orphanage for a number of years or time and part of our ministry team there and now they're here doing some stuff so glad to have set them in when I was here a few months or sometime last year I gave a teaching in the evening at Windward, uh, and if you were there, this is kind of part two, chapter two of this same message. So open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. And what I want to do is give uh, a little history before I read these two verses that I want to read, and it's a history about what we're about to read. It's actually one of the sad times in Israel's history. This was a time when of the 12 tribes of Israel, two tribes and 10 tribes went into a civil war against each other. I don't wanna get into the civil war and the, what was going on there. There's just a little detail that I'd like to give about this. And 
Uh, it's about the tribe of Benjamin who was calling their men to fight for this battle. It says in Judges chapter 20, I want to read actually verse 15 and 16 to throw them off that we're going to put it on the board behind me. But it says this, uh, Judges chapter 20, verse 15, it says at once the Benjamites, Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordmen from their towns. In addition to 700 able men uh, from who were living in Gebeah. Among all those soldiers were 700 select troops who were left handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. When the time came for Benjamin to muster their troops, the Bible makes uh, clear that they were able to gather 26,000 men. And then it mentions, and besides the 26,000 men, and it, it specifically mentions about these 26,000 men, uh, that they could each draw a sword. That's an important little note that we'll talk about in a minute. But these 26,000 men, who could draw a sword? And then it says, in addition, there were 700 select men. And when it talks about these select men, it gives two qualifications for them. Kind of curious. The first qualification was they were all left-handed. The second qualification of the 700 special forces is what I like to call them is they could sling a stone at 35 meters at a hair and not miss. Now, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the hair and things like that just to give some background. It kind of gives background into David and Goliath, who also could sling a stone fairly well. And what they would do in Israel to train when they did the stone sling is they would back up about 35 paces or 35 meters away and they would take a long hair from a woman and they would tie a rock at the bottom and tie the other uh, end of it on the branch of a tree because I mean at 35 meters I can't even see a hair and how do you know you split a hair uh, you know you're just not going to know so what they would do with that rock and then tie the other up on a tree is when they slung the stone when the rock fell they knew they split the hair and the Bible says these 700 select men would not miss. Now, backing up a little bit, it says that there was uh, 26,000 men who could draw a sword. That's key. And then it says the 700 men who were all left-handed and could all sling a sling. That is also key. And here's the key in there. You see, who could draw a sword? Back in those days, they didn't have right-handed and left-handed swords. They only made the swords and everybody who fought in a battle, that you would use your right hand and everybody had the right hand with the sword and the left hand was for the shield. And the reason they did that is they would get into these shield walls is what they would call them. In fact, Rome got so good with these shield walls that they could drive a chariot on top of them. They were, they were literally, they would lock their shields with the man next to them. In fact, uh, through Greece, through Rome, and even in the Bible days, whenever you got into a shield wall, the shield was never to protect yourself. It was always to protect the guy next to you on your left hand. It was, there was with one hand with your sword, you would poke at the enemy and with the other shield, you were protecting the man next to you and the man next to you was protecting you. And now this is key because the Bible talks about the shield of faith. Just stay with me for a few minutes as we get into these details because the man, you see, sometimes our faith doesn't only protect us, it protects the guys next to us. You see, it's not just about us. The shield of faith protects you and the guy next to you. So what, what happened is every man had a shield with their left hand and a sword with their right hand. And they would get into these shield walls and march against the enemy. 26,000 men could draw 
use the sword and the shield. But then it goes on and it mentions these 700 men. Now I want to draw some more stuff on these 700 guys because number one, every one of them was left-handed. Now I looked that up in the original language and I, I was just kind of digging, why does the Bible specifically says 700 left-handed men? And they happen to be select men, special forces, if you will. And why did the Bible mention 700 left-handed? Well, I do what everybody does. You go to the Bible dictionaries in the original Hebrew and Greek languages. And, and I found out what left-handed means. Are you ready? It means not right-handed. I was really digging deep. <laughs> but then you, you, when you dig deeper, what it means is they're not right-handed, but they were right-handed. And that's the key. You see, every one of these men at one point in their life were wounded. Probably they could no longer hold the sword. They, could, they at one time could hold the sword and hold the shield wall and poke the enemy with their right hand. But somewhere along the line, they were no longer able to hold the sword. So what happened is maybe they lost a finger and couldn't grip the sword well. Or maybe they lost two or three fingers or part of their hand. But whatever happened, these 700 men were at one point wounded in battle. Have you ever been wounded? If you hang around Christians long enough, believe me, you will be. Because that's just what happens sometimes. So these 700 men were wounded. Now, if ever you're wounded in a battle, you've got a choice. You're, you're technically handicapped. And if you're handicapped and can no longer fight in the traditional way, you can no longer draw a sword and, and hold the shield with your left hand and, and fight uh, the way everybody else fights, you have a choice. You're technically handicapped. You can go home or you can stay. The only problem is if you stay, you've got to learn to fight a different way. I was doing a study. I wrote a book a, a while back on honor. It's called, uh, um, I'm thinking in Spanish, El Peso de Honra, Honor Found in English. Um, but when I was doing this study, I, I was digging through military terms. And there's a military term that actually intrigues me, uh, intrigued me when I was studying this. And the military term is eye of the tiger. Have you ever heard that term, eye of the tiger? It's more than just Rocky running up the steps in Philadelphia. Okay. Eye of the tiger literally means, uh, it's, a, it's a military term, and what it means in the confusion of the battle, in the, in the fog of war, it's when things slow down to almost slow motion, and in the middle of the confusion of battle, you can see clearly and know exactly what to do. Uh, that is called the eye of the tiger. And there's a military term about that. And the military term is this, that once a man has been wounded in battle, it's hard for him to be wounded again. They become extremely valuable in battle because they will develop a sixth sense. In certain places, in positions in war, if you've got new people that are just coming onto the scene of the battle, these men have been wounded, and because of this sixth sense, they will sense things that others won't sense. They'll, they'll, they'll be able to sense, wait a minute, I, the enemy is out there, and the other guys will say, I don't see anything, I don't hear anything. No, I feel him. It's that eye of the tiger. And in a battle, the eye of the tiger can be extremely valuable because they they just have that sense about them they're they're able to to know things to do things to, just because they've been there they've seen how the enemy fights they've seen where he's coming from and because they've seen how he fights and where he's coming from they can actually protect the other guys around them so technically these 700 special forces that we read about in the tribe of Benjamin that were all left-handed. They were all left-handed because somewhere along the line, they were wounded. 
And now they've got a choice. What are you going to do? You're technically handicapped. You can go home, call 1-800-CRY-BABY. Oh, I've been hurt. Or you can stay and learn to fight, but you have to fight another way. Let me go into this, because if you go home, that's just what the enemy wants us to do. Just go home. Just go home. It's just been too hard. You've been hurt. Somewhere along the line, you've been hurt. That's what the enemy wants us to do, to go home. And, and what happens when you go home? It's usually we just kind of go into our bedroom, put the covers over our head and just scream out, leave me alone. Now, the Bible says, and I want to do a little twist around this and come back into it. Let me just ask this first. Have you ever been wounded? You ever just been hit, blindsided by something? I think I told this story I, um, a number of years ago. I was at a conference up in Ukraine and flying back to Peru from the Ukraine. It's a long flight with my wife. And as we were flying back, she just casually mentioned on the airplane that she wanted to go to the doctor just to, to get a checkup when we got back home. And we got home on a Thursday. And for sure enough, Friday, she goes into the doctor's office. And I was doing some stuff in the office because I'd been away for quite a while. So as I'm doing my stuff in the office, my daughter calls me from the hospital and says, Dad, you need to come down here now. And I'm saying, why? I could tell by her voice something just wasn't right. She goes, just come to the hospital now. And so I ran over to the clinic, which was just a few blocks away from our office. And when I walked into the doctor's office and saw my wife on the hospital bed and with the doctors running around, that day we got the news that my wife had an aggressive late stage cancer in her body. And it was to me, it was like a train wreck. It was like, oh, God, you know, I wasn't prepared for this. It was a, it was very aggressive, late stage. It was already in her cervix and in her uh, lymph nodes and other parts of the body. And when I got this news, I, it, I, I mean, the first thing that comes to me is, but I'm your servant. I serve you. I'm a pastor. And now this has attacked my family. Well, you know, the natural thing is, now what? And I, and I remember as my wife and I, I just said, let's get the church to pray. So we went into church and, I, and my wife led worship in those days. And as I was walking in the back of the church and, uh, and I saw my wife just up on the screens, I stood in the back and just watched for a while and, and literally began to cry because I, I asked God, I said, is this the last time I get to watch her do this? And it, it was like we just got hit. See, sometimes you get wounded and it's because you have an enemy. Sometimes we're wounded because we just made dumb mistakes. You ever made a really bad decision that's created chaos in your life? You can't really blame an enemy or the devil for it. It was just you were dumb. <laughs> sometimes it's our own foolishness. Sometimes it's just because the Bible says the earth that we live in is stubborn because of the curse. Sometimes it's because there's evil people. Sometimes it's just the devil who is attacking us. But whatever happens, wounds happen. And when my wife, she, I, we stood up and asked the church to pray. And we just said, you know, we just found out she's got this cancer. And my wife stood up in the pulpit and she said this. She said, God did not send this. I have an enemy. And all of a sudden, it was like a spirit of fight. She's going to fight. I'm going to fight with her. And I can just say this. She fought like a woman. And is cancer free today. I mean... You ladies, you're way stronger than us guys. You can give birth to babies and stuff like that and fight cancer. And, and man, we just wimp out. But she fought. And I mean, it wasn't easy. There was surgeries. There was radiation, chemo, and all this stuff that she had to go through, plus the prayers of the people. And, but she came through it. And I mean, she would literally come out of chemo and go straight into leading worship and then go to bed and, um, and during these times. But she's handicapped 
but she has the eye of the tiger. Because we can be in a crowd of 10,000 people and my wife will disappear and I'll say, where is she? And she'll see that lady with a little do wrap on her head with, uh, with no hair and she'll just be over there and just being able to pray with them. But you see, she has the eye of the tiger. See, the eye of the tiger means once you've been wounded, you see what others don't. I need some people with the eye of the tiger around me. Maybe the enemy has attacked your marriage. Maybe the enemy has attacked your, your physical. Maybe, maybe you've had an issue with drugs or pornography or other things. And, and because of that, and you've come through the other side. Okay, you got wounded, but somehow you stayed in the fight. You didn't quit and go home. You came back and you say, wait a minute, I lost a finger but I can still fight. Maybe I'm left-handed, but I can still fight. Well, you know, what the enemy wants you to do is just go home. The Bible says this. The Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. It wasn't good in the beginning and it's not good now. It is not good for man to be alone. It's just not good. And it's more than just a, a, a verse on marriage. It's really a verse on each one of us. It's not good that you try to do this life by yourself. It's not good. You see, and let me give you the context. When God wrote that, it's not good for man to be alone. And you have to understand this first. God created man in his image. God created us. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are spirit, soul, and body and created in his image. And, and, and God said in this context, it's not good that man is alone. You see, when the Bible says God is love, that little statement, God is love, is one of the most amazing theological statements that you can find in the Old Testament. Because when the Bible says God is love, it proves the existence of the Holy Trinity. Just the statement, God is love, shows us the Trinity exists because love is never one by itself. And God is love. He didn't just become love when he created the world. He is love. And, and that just shows the relationship that the Father had toward the Son and the Son had toward the Father and the Father and the Son have toward the Holy Spirit. You see, God is love. Love always gives. Love always gives at the expense of one. Lust receives at the expense of others. God is love. And when the Bible says God is love and he created man in his image, I mean, you got to think when God said it is not good that man is alone. That was when Adam walked with God all by himself. Every afternoon, Adam would walk through the garden and the Bible says God walked with Adam in the garden. And in this context of God and Adam and, and we think of paradise and Adam out there naming animals and working the fields and doing what he did and God coming and walking with Adam in the context of Adam having God all to himself, God said, I'm not enough. It's not good that man is alone. You see, we've been created in his image. And I love this because the Bible says everything God created, he created the heavens and the earth, it's good. Put the animals in there, it's good. Put the fish in the sea, it's good. God created the, the plants and he said, that's good. The first day, it's good. The heavens and the earth, it's good. And then God said, it's not good that man is alone and then put Adam to sleep and Adam woke up and said it's good <laughs> he's creating God's image 
but what God was saying is, it's not good to do this life alone. And see, what the enemy wants to do is whenever you've been wounded is to get you by yourself. I was thinking about another story, and um, there's a story called, of Mephizobet, and I'm not sure I'm even saying his name right. Mephizobet. You, know, you guys know the story of Mephizobet? How many don't know the story of Mephizobet? King Saul had a son, Jonathan. Jonathan had a son, Mephizabet. And when Jonathan died, it's a sad story because uh, uh, the maid was running with Jonathan's baby and tripped and the baby fell and became lame at the feet. And the rest of this baby's life, he was lame. He was basically handicapped. So we don't see much about Mephizabet anymore because King David went into power. Now King David is there and and finally, one day, King David said, you know, I want to honor the house of Saul. Is there anybody left? And they said, well, there's just this one kid, but he's handicapped. He's handicapped. And it's interesting because he was living in a city called Lodabar. Lodabar literally means a land of silence. And Mephizabeth, this handicapped guy, is all by himself in a land of silence. Do you know what the devil's prayer is the devil's prayer is this leave me alone it's not good that man should be alone it's not good God didn't create us the Bible says God takes lonely people and puts them in families and and I love that about families God takes us and puts us in families and and together we we get so much better the Bible one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Isaiah 65 it says new wine is found in the cluster New wine is found in the cluster. What's a cluster? It's a bunch of grapes connected to the vine. We know the vine is Jesus. The cluster is there. What happens if you take a grape away from the vine and set it by itself? What happens? You no, know, it becomes a raisin. There's a lot of raisin faced Christians out there because they're disconnected. It's not good for man to be alone. The juice, the wine is in there connected to the vine with everybody else. But if you disconnect yourself and go to Lodi Bar, the land of silence, and say, I just want to be by myself, just leave me alone. And all of a sudden you're there by yourself. It's like a raisin. Just there. You're sweet. You're going to heaven. But it's just so much better together. It's so much better together. Well, I had a friend of mine, because of what he was going through and what we went through with my wife, in fact, he's part of Hillsong family, like we are, we're part of the family with you guys, and we're Hillsong family in Peru, and Charles Neiman, his wife, Rochelle, I remember I was with Charles once, and he said, I'm only going to tell you this because you went through this, but my wife has cancer. And I said, oh, my God, we will pray with you. It's not good to be alone. We need some battle people to go with us. And, and, and when Charles Neiman, he got that news, well, her cancer was very aggressive. And it took her life. And it just about crushed Charles Neiman, a great pastor, great church just about crushed Charles Neiman, but it took her life on a Sunday morning and on Wednesday night he was preaching in church. And then the following Friday was New Year's Eve and he did the New Year's Eve service and then a prayer night. And then the next Sunday he was in the pulpit preaching in church and, and people came to Charles and they said, listen, you just lost your wife. Why don't you just rest? Go, go, be by yourself someplace. Somebody even suggested, why don't you just go to an island in the Caribbean? You just lost your wife. Just, just go by yourself. Go to the Caribbean. And I remember I called him and he says, Robert, can you imagine me right now all by myself in the Caribbean? And then he gave me this verse, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. 
The literal translation is, they that gather together in the name of the Lord will renew your strength. You see, the enemy wants when you're going through a hard time, just get by yourself. What God says is, no, get together with people because together with people, you'll renew your strength. Get together with people. You see, let's go back. And as I wind this up about the 700 special forces, guys, these 700 men were all wounded, but they didn't go home. In fact, they learned to fight a different way. Now, I don't know if anybody, you know, if you're right handed, you ever try writing with your left hand? Or throwing a baseball with your other hand. I mean, it just kind of doesn't look right. Uh, I'm right-handed. I like to surf. Uh, we still do sometimes in Peru. I've surfed my whole life. So Peru's got some of the greatest surf. And I love the beach. People say, do you still surf? We have great board meetings. You want to be on my board, believe me. But surfers, you know, your regular foot and your goofy foot. And if you're regular foot, you surf right-handed. If you're goofy foot, you go left. And then there's these crazy freaks that can go both ways. It's that they took the time to learn. I was always envious of goofy foot people. They could just, you know, surf right and surf left. Well, you see, to take the time to be able to do something unnatural with your left hand after you fought your whole life with your right hand and you did it so well that now you can split a hair at 35 meters and not miss. Every one of these 700 men had the eye of the tiger. Every one of these men had the eye of the tiger. So let me wind this up with this. You see, if you've ever been wounded, and believe me, if you're still right-handed, hang around. You'll lose a finger sooner or later. And it's only because we have an enemy. But if you've ever been wounded, now you've got a choice. Go or stay. If you stay, you see, if you stay, you're going to have to learn to fight another way. But now you've seen how the enemy fights. Some of you who have been attacked in your marriage, you know how he attacks your marriage. And you have the eye of the tiger and you'll see that young couple in there and you'll say, wait a minute, nobody else sees this, but I recognize this. You'll, you'll identify immediately with others that have been wounded in the same. You see, once what the enemy tried to use to take you out, to some just makes them better. What the enemy did to try to take you out of the battle can actually make you better. So what are we going to do? There's a lot of reasons to quit. I mean, you can hide. You can go to Lodibar, the land of silence, where nobody knows where you are, like Mephizabeth. Or you can do it King David did and said, that young man out there in the land of silence, bring him in because he was called to eat at the king's table. And every day he was back eating at the king's table. You see, the enemy would love to tell you it's over. But I've learned a secret. Never put a period where God puts a comma. Because it's not over. The best is yet to come. Amen? It's not over. And if you've been attacked, it's not over. And if you want to go home and hide under the covers, get out. It's not over. Come back to church. Don't be that grape sitting out there by itself or raisin. No, I'm going to go because those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. Those that gather together in the name of the Lord will find new strength. And now you'll need to fight a different way, but you have the eye of the tiger. You've seen what the enemy did. And you can help some others along the way. Amen. Father, I thank you for this awesome church. I thank you for, God, the future of this house. I stand together with the 
leadership in this house saying the best is yet to come. And I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing and what you will do. And Father, I pray for anybody here that has been wounded, been wounded because of life, because of their own bad decisions, because of an enemy, whatever it is, wherever the enemy has come in and hurt or whatever has been done that has caused hurt. And the enemy would love to say it's over. No, it's not. No, it's not. Having done all to stand, stand ye therefore. In Jesus' name. Amen.